Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where yesterday Joss Whedon kind of set the internet aflame by saying that he would be interested in directing a Star Wars movie. Uh, I think that it only kind of set the internet aflame because, you know, it's just an idea in Joss Whedon's head. And also I think that Joss Whedon has really fallen off the pop culture radar. I mean, some are still faithful to him for what he contributed uh, via two Avengers movies, right? Uh, but I think it shows just how outside the fanboy consciousness Joss Whedon is at this point, which is why I think maybe he wants to direct a Star Wars movie because he's missing the spotlight. You know, he had a really bad experience with Avengers Age of Ultron, which we will return to in just a second, uh, and it made him quit Twitter. He was like, I'm out of here. But I think, of course, and who wouldn't, I think he misses ruling over massive Comic-Con uh, presentations. I mean, he still goes to Comic-Con, but it's not the same, and really just making headline after headline. So I think he's like, how can I return to that? I know, Star Wars. Uh, and fans absolutely love the idea. And just to clarify, he said that he doesn't want to make a Star Wars uh, episode movie, you know, the main uh, films, but he would like to do a, a spin-off story like Rogue One. He said he was really impressed that, that with the creative freedom that that allowed. Although, just ask Gareth Edwards how much creative freedom it allows because he was seriously <laughs> overruled on like pretty much the entire film with massive reshoots and uh, Tony Gilroy basically just taking over the movie. So uh, Gareth Edwards would be like, yeah, it's, the, the reality is not as great as the dream. Uh, but anyway, so while, as I said, fans are very excited about this idea and a number of you tweeted me saying, what do you think of Joss Whedon directing a Star Wars movie? And he and Kathleen Kennedy, to some degree, might get along because she's really trying to push female characters, and Joss Whedon, of course, is known for doing a really good job with female characters. Although, he really stepped in it with Black Widow. I like his Black Widow quite a bit, but he annoyed a lot of people with the uh, not only the Hulk romance, but the whole thing about her feeling she was a monster. Um, people felt it was because she said she couldn't have kids. I don't think that's why she felt she was a monster. I think she felt she was a monster because of all the horrible things she did back when she worked, um, you know, for, uh, she was like a, a government assassin as part of the Black Widow program. You know, she said she's got a lot of red in her ledger, not, I can't have babies. Uh, but anyway, uh, you got to be real careful with the SJWs. Uh, and uh, he got taken down hard. Now, speaking of taking down hard, I guess you can say in some ways, it's karma. Karma's a B-I-T-C-H, a biatch, all right? Because <laughs> um, he was really mean to Disney, as you might recall. And this is where I think this gets sticky, because Star Wars, of course, is a Disney property. So as much as fans might want Joss Whedon to direct a Star Wars movie, uh, and as much as Joss Whedon might want to, I mean, and also Brad Bird said he wanted to direct a Star Wars movie, and he didn't get the call. You know, no call from Lucasfilm. No call from Kathleen Kennedy. And he was really vocal about it, too. And he has a great relationship with Disney. And they were like, mm. well, actually, maybe not. Maybe after Tomorrowland, they were like, no. Go back to doing animation, please. Uh, so, Because that, of course, was for Disney as well. Uh, so the Mouse House, I think they're forgiving to a point. But speaking of forgiveness, Joss Whedon was so upset with the way things went down with Age of Ultron that, as you might recall, he was extremely negative in the press towards uh, the whole experience and Kevin Feige, you know, saying, uh, you know, they, they made me shoehorn in, like, the, the Thor stuff so that I could do the Hawkeye, you know, personal drama situation. Like, it was just so much negotiating from a business standpoint, and they said my movie had to check certain boxes that I didn't want to check, and he just was really negative about the whole thing. And to, to the point that I feel that Disney would be like, do we really want to do that again? Do you, Kathleen Kennedy, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure she must talk to Kevin Feige sometimes, right? They're, uh, they're at the same level within the same company. Uh, she's the Kevin Feige of Star Wars. You know, I think she'd be like, you know what? What if you turn on me, Joss Whedon? Because I got boxes that I need you to check as well. So I think that that's where the real problem is going to come for Joss Whedon getting work going forward, that he was just so negative in the press, uh, you know, publicly towards the studio and the people that he was working for. That's a really bad thing to do. Uh, he also said that he wanted, he wanted to do a Bond movie. So again, I just think that Joss Whedon is job hunting. <laughs> we'll see if anyone bites. All right, so speaking of Star Wars, that's the second story of the day, and that they really uh, divulged some interesting backstory about Orson Krennic uh, and Jin Erso's father uh, yesterday in USA Today to promote a prequel book for the prequel, uh, Catalyst, Star Wars Catalyst. Now, if you don't want any spoilers for Star Wars Rogue One, you might want to skip to the third story. As always, there are chapter times in the video description. But this might not be covered in the movie because 
why else write the book, right? I think that's such a, well, I think I'll be covered in the movie to some degree, obviously, because where will you hear it? But I, I always thought, found that very odd that they were like, we're going to do most of Finn's development as a character in a book outside of The Force Awakens. And you see this, you know, the, the traitor, the trait, uh, I love the way that everyone spelled traitor is that guy's name, the stormtrooper who yells traitor at Finn during that fight. It's because they're pals and they train together. But it's weird because watching the movie, you'd be, you would not know that unless you read this uh, outside material. So I'm fine with Star Wars operating on multiple levels, and it's up to you how how deep you want to get into Star Wars. But the the first level should be accessible to all, right? Or there shouldn't be left there shouldn't be anything where you're like, what's that? What are you talking about? You know, it should just be something that you notice if you're uh, if you're if you're looking for it. So anyway, all right. So you've obviously have skipped ahead at this point. Uh, you've had enough time. So it was revealed that Orson Krennic, played by Ben Mendelsohn, and Galen Erso, played by Mads Mikkelsen are actually pals uh and then krennic saved uh gallon and his baby and baby Jin. Uh, i don't know where mama ursa is or so is but he saved them from captivity and so they're pals and they've known each other for for years the whole time that Jin was growing up i guess until the point that uh, <laughs> uh ben mendelson strongly suggested that his pal come help make the death star or you know how much was his arm twisted right because this is, and I would say that this friendship, you know, we've, I've talked about the silence between the two characters in the latest trailer. You know, Mendelssohn and Mickelson are just staring at each other. And maybe because they, uh, their dialogue would be like, as soon as they open their mouths, they'd be like, hey, buddy. And, everyone, and you know, maybe give something away. I don't know. But what struck me about this coverage was that the, the, the Star Wars team said that they felt that the Death Star relationship, you know, creating this awesome weapon was kind of like Jobs and Wozniak, right? Uh, and I thought that was really interesting. Like, first of all, the Death Star is the ultimate Apple product. I was like, that's a cool way to go. But the thing that I thought was even more interesting was painting this Orson Krennic character as the Star Wars version of Steve Jobs. I was like, whoa. I mean, I think that's a little unfair to Steve Jobs, right? That he would work for the Empire. I don't. I, th I can't think of anyone less likely to work for the Empire. He would just be probably the most difficult person in the Rebellion. But he would get results, right? Um, I think so. It's a little bit of a slight to be like, I think it's funny and kind of it's kind of just shows you the nature of celebrity and fame that Steve Jobs would start out like here as like this, uh, you know, Gandhi of the tech world, right? As genius or, or, or maybe Tesla of the tech world is a better idea. And then he would turn into somebody who works for the empire because I'm just I think that the just the as soon as he died everyone was like oh we can call him a jerk now and I, I mean I think that's not so great I have major problems with that actually I think that Steve Jobs uh just because he has a, a really you know difficult personal demeanor doesn't mean he should be vilified but Orson Krennic does have an amazing white cape you know as beautiful as uh Steve Jobs' own uh, aesthetic design aesthetic so at least you know at least he's a cool empire villain maybe Orson Krennic isn't that much of a villain we'll discover maybe he's just misguided or you know that's where that's who was hiring the it's hard out there in Star Wars world and you know the empire they had the only job offer on the table. The rebellion doesn't pay. All right. So I'm curious, what do you think of that? And if you're going to discuss it down below, put spoiler, uh, you know, a spoiler warning for everybody who did skip ahead. All right. So the third story of the day, let's head over to Warner Brothers, Disney's enemy. <laughs> uh, I think it's actually more the other way around because Warner Brothers hasn't proven to be too much of a threat just yet. But Warner Brothers is going to do something really interesting. They're going to distribute the film Crazy Rich Asians, which is being directed by John Chu based on Kevin Kwan's book. And this is just amazing to me how fast uh, Asian talent is being incorporated into Hollywood, right? It's like, it's almost as if Hollywood was like, oh, you want representation? Nobody knew. Okay. And you know, like I've never seen a group this fa this quickly assimilated into the lands the entertainment landscape i mean if you as i said before if you watch the new television shows so much asian talent is getting uh hired it's absolutely amazing uh and so you know john chu is his movie's coming at just the right point uh but you know actually the only thing i feel bad about with this film is john chu's involvement you know he did you know he's okay he's serviceable uh he did like uh gi joe uh you know, the retaliation. He also did uh, Jim, right? Uh, so John Chu, I think that he's a, he's a solid hitter as a director, but I think for something like this to work on a, on a large enough scale, I think you need someone a little more talented. But anyway, uh, it's based on Kevin Kwan's book, and it's about an American-born Chinese economics, American Chinese economics professor. So it's an Asian woman who only really knows the United States. That's her world. But she starts dating someone whose family lives in Singapore, and she goes to visit her boyfriend's family, 
family for a wedding. And she's really surprised to see what kind of um, what kind of society and, and you know uh, what the what the culture is like and how people interact in Singapore, right? So it's it's described as a crazy world of old money, new money. Uh, you know, nosy relatives and his really, the really difficult mom of his, of her boyfriend. So that sounds interesting to me. And they're really, uh, really uh, pointing out that this will be an entirely Asian cast. And if you wonder if that can work with the mainstream uh, American audience, I would go watch the season premiere of this season. I think it's season three of Fresh Off the Boat on ABC, where that family went to, uh, I believe, uh, Taiwan. And I watched it because I wanted to see Taiwan. And it was really interesting. And they also kind of dealt. It was kind of like a, a sitcom version of Crazy Rich Asians, dealing with how how it was very different to be in this, uh, you know, uh, monogamous, uh, no, uh, oh, uh, not, not monog, what's, uh, uh, you know, almost 100% Asian society. If you can think of the vocab word, write it down below. Uh, but, you know, the, but while that, you know, you were entering a society of almost all, uh, all Asians, it was also a very, it wasn't like America. There were different traditions, different uh, different hierarchy. It was really interesting to watch, actually. I really enjoyed the episode. And it was funny, because that, of course, was the whole point of it. Uh, so I think that this could really work. But uh, again, I think John Chu is the weakest element here. But uh, as I've been saying, this is the best time I've ever seen to be an actor of color. Uh, the opportunities out there are amazing. And I think, to Hollywood's credit, I don't think the opportunities for um, you know, white actors are diminishing. I mean, they're, they're not across the, across the, the board anymore, but there's a lot, I think it's nice to see there are a lot of opportunities for everyone. And for a lot of roles, particularly on uh, television, uh, you know, s supporting roles and guest starring roles, they are colorblind in the casting process, which is nice. All right, so let's go to the viewer question. This is from Super, uh, Super Shanko, uh, Super Shanko. All right, that's a great name. All right. So Super Shanko says, question, insert favorite emojis. And everybody, I like that. Not everybody has emojis available to them. Sometimes I'm on, I'm on my desktop. Somebody said you can get emojis on your desktop, but I haven't had time to figure out how. But anyway, Super Shanko says, I'll keep it short and ask, with the upcoming Justice League trailer, i.e. the real one, you know, not like the behind the scenes footage that they've been showing, uh, or the Comic-Con reel, do you think they're going to basically hide Superman or tease his return in the trailers since it'll end up as another plot point? Uh, I think they're not going to hide it because everybody's seen him in that footage, you know, particularly the last batch. He was uh, walking around definitely a part of the movie. Uh, I mean, they didn't really focus very much on his death. Uh, you know, as much as I like Batman v Superman, I feel they wasted the death of Superman storyline, quite frankly. Uh, and so I think they're probably not going to do much with the resurrection of Superman either, right? And even when we saw him on set, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe it'll be flashbacks, but he looked already back in the blue and the red. He had the, he had the short hair. Uh, so I don't know what's going on. So I don't think, but I think there's no reason to hide it because again, we've seen him. So I think they'll certainly tease it for sure. Now, I think the more, the, this leads to an, another interesting, uh, well, I think a very important discussion about the trailer, and that's when will we see it, right? So I think that just like uh, Marvel, they have to be careful not to overshadow the first movie that's coming up, and that's, of course, Wonder Woman. So when Rogue One hits theaters uh, in December 16th, uh, around then ac across the globe, uh, although I think Star Wars movies basically open day and date, I think that's when you're going to probably get another Wonder Woman trailer, right? Because that's the first movie up uh, in June, late June. Uh, and uh, Justice League, of course, doesn't come out until November of next year. So I think you're probably, you're definitely going to see one with a wonder, the trailer with Wonder Woman. But I think June, oh yeah, it's uh, June 2nd. I think that's a bit late. It's actually early June. I think that's a bit late to start promoting uh, Justice League because it's such a big movie. So I would suspect, and also of course it'll have a huge presence at Comic-Con because again, it doesn't come out until November. So I would expect Justice League, a trailer to debut uh, with maybe the Lego Batman movie, uh, February 10th, or a month later with Kong Skull Island, these are all Warner Brothers movies, uh, on March 10th. So I think that, uh, again, while they're promoting Justice League, they really have to sell Wonder Woman first. They want to make sure they have, they have a hit because uh, they have two so far, uh, and I think they don't want to lose any of that momentum. So expect uh, Wonder Woman to get all the attention first. Uh, although, and that's interesting. I'd be curious. I do think people have already moved to Justice League. I think that Wonder Woman, not enough in the conversation when you think about it. I think they need to, they need a new trailer really badly. And I think they need to start showing what's going to happen in the actual movie besides the obvious, right? She meets Steve Trevor and comes to man's world. Uh, and it takes place during World War One. I. I think they need to show a little, they need to show who the villains are going to be, like confirm them. There are theories, of course, uh, and show a little bit more action. Uh, I mean, they had the international trailer recently, but it was literally just a couple of seconds long. And not even new scenes, just they extended a couple of scenes we've seen already by seconds. So, uh, so thank you for your question. 
a question, Super Shanko. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. Please write down below think today's top three stories, Super Shanko's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, uh, well, Monday, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.